It was the year 1974 when W.D. Richter, an up-and-coming script analyst for Warner Brothers and an alumnus of Dartmouth College, found himself engrossed in an eccentric novel, Dirty Pictures from the Prom. It was actually his wife who had stumbled upon the book and, entranced by its unconventional narrative, had recommended it to him. Richter was struck by the author's unique voice, Earl Mack Roch, a fellow Dartmouth graduate, carving his path as a novelist. Intrigued by this creative talent from his alma mater, Richter reached out to Roch, and during their correspondence, Roch expressed a desire to transition into screenwriting. Seizing the opportunity to bring in such an imaginative storyteller, Richter extended an invitation to visit him in Los Angeles. As time passed, Richter flourished as a successful screenwriter, while Roch had been nurturing his own creative ambitions, until the day he was ready to venture into the labyrinth of the film industry. Richter, true to his word, introduced Roch to the influential producer-director Erwin Winkler. Winkler recognized Roch's potential and offered him a lifeline, rent money for six months, security that would allow him to focus on his work. And it was during this time that Roch began to share a character who had taken residence in his imagination, a man named Buckaroo Bandy. Over the course of several dinners, Roch detailed his vision, and the concept so captivated Richter and his wife that they invested $1,500 for Roch to evolve his idea into a full-fledged screenplay. The character was imbued with the essence of the high-octane, relentless energy of early 70s kung fu movies that Roch admired. However, the journey to a completed script was far from smooth. Roch would start a story only to abandon it midway through, lost in a maze of narrative threads. This cycle repeated itself until a dozen unfinished buckaroo scripts lay discarded in the drawers of Roch's writing desk. But as we'll see, this wasn't wasted effort at all. Roch's original blueprint, a 30-page treatment, was christened as Find the Jet Car, said the President, a buckaroo bonsai thriller. Yes, not buckaroo bandy. As the narrative evolved, so did the character's name, morphing into Buckaroo Banzai. Roger initially resisted this change, but Richter persuaded him to really embrace it. As the screenplay evolved, other characters began to populate this universe, notably the Hong Kong Cavaliers. Still, the elusive ending remained out of reach. Roch tinkered with it while he wrote other scripts, including the acclaimed New York, New York for the legendary Martin Scorsese. These were the formative years of Buckaroo Banzai, a period of experimentation, growth, and transformation. From the whirlwind of discarded scripts, character metamorphoses, and shifting storylines emerged the seed at the center of this world, a thing that gave it appeal to many, the sense that you've stepped from your mundane life and into that of someone else, a renaissance man with a history that shows that the craziness of today is not an isolated incident, but just the latest in the many scrapes and dramas that this ever-growing circle has had to dig through. It's certainly not just another day at the office, but it's not our first rodeo either. So, the year 1980, and W.D. Richter, having just penned a screenplay, sits down with producers Frank Marshall and Neil Canton. This would be the same Frank Marshall who was at that time producing a little film called Raiders of the Lost Ark. And the following year, along with his wife Kathleen Kennedy and Steven Spielberg, would found Amblin Entertainment. It would be at Amblin that Neil Canton would be involved in the biggest franchise of his career, Back to the Future. Little realizing that the actor Christopher Lloyd, who until then was most famous for being the bizarre Jim on Taxi, was about to be given a role that would forever change his perception from drug-addled weirdo to eccentric genius, Doc Brown. A role that likely never would have been if not for this meeting. Out of that meeting, an alliance forms. Canton and Richter create their own production company where Richter could finally have the chance to move from writing into directing. And naturally, they decide that their first film would be Buckaroo Banzai. Soon, Mac Roch crafted a 60-page treatment titled Lepers from Saturn. It was everything they wanted. A wild, outlandish concept, the likes of which have never been seen before. However, there was also a problem here. It was a wild, outlandish concept, the likes of which had never been seen before. 
trying to sell that, and with a first-time director at the helm, was not working small. Fortunately, the answer was a seasoned pro, veteran producer Sidney Beckerman at MGMUA. Producer of such varied films as the comedy-drama heist war film, Kelly's Heroes, to the most successful western of 1972, Joe Kidd, to the famously dark picture of Sir Laurence Olivier and Dustin Hoffman, Marathon Man. Beckerman was not the kind of producer who was scared away by unconventional ideas. Beckerman quickly took a shine to the eccentric project, introducing Canton and Richter to the head honcho, studio chief David Bedgelman. And voila, within 24 hours, they're in business, their unconventional vision backed by the power of a studio. But the journey of the Banzai script is far from over. Over a year and a half, Mac Roch meticulously weaves the final script. The lepers from Saturn evolving into lizards and then lectroids from Planet 10. He breathes life into the characters, pulling threads from his previously discarded Banzai scripts to create rich backstories. But just as things are heating up, they hit a roadblock. The Writers Guild of America strikes in 1981, forcing the project into a long hibernation. Meanwhile, Bedjelman's tenure at MGM comes to an end, casting a shadow of uncertainty over the fate of Banzai. Yet much like the character he's working to bring to life, Bedjelman is nothing if not tenacious. He forms Sherwood Productions and swoops in, saving Banzai from oblivion, buying out the script from MGM. Taking this gem to 20th Century Fox, he secures a deal to bring Banzai to life with a budget of $12 million. Roch wrote three more drafts for the final shooting script while efforts were underway to bring the character to life. After all, who do you cast to play a character like this? A leading man who's a neurosurgeon, a rock star, and a grease-stained hero. It's going to require a seriously talented actor to pull off such a multifaceted role. An established star made the most sense, and Tom Hanks was suggested. He was fresh off the success of Bosom Buddies, but unfortunately, that made people think of him more as a TV star, not a movie star. Michael Keaton was also approached, but a three-picture deal was more than what he wanted to commit to. But the failure to secure either was just fine with the guys who were actually making the picture. Tom Hanks and Michael Keaton were, even then, undeniably talented and popular actors, but that was the problem. Their faces were already too well known for what Richter and Canton had in mind. Instead, they looked to New York City, being a playground for budding stage and film actors, expecting they could find someone who could skillfully interact with the bizarre, prop-heavy world of Banzai. Enter Peter Weller, impressive in his minor role in Shoot the Moon. Yet he was cautious, unsure of the film's tone. Was it going to be campy, cartoonish, a satirical take on reality? Richter assuaged his fears, painting a picture of a wacky yet grounded universe. It didn't take long before Weller was sold, and he based the character on an eclectic mix. Uh, Elia Kazan, Jacques Cousteau, Albert Einstein, Leonardo da Vinci, even musician Adam Ant. It was a cocktail of influences like no other for a character who was like no other. In another twist of fate, and showing how out of step the creatives were with the studio, while they wanted a star for the lead and an unknown for the villain, Mac Roch had envisioned the talented John Lithgow for the part. Lithgow being praised for his Oscar-nominated role in The World According to Garp and his recent success with Terms of Endearment. Lithgow, like Weller, had his reservations about the character, but Richter sold him on the opportunity to feast on a truly over-the-top Jekyll and Hyde persona. He decided to adopt a form of accent off of an Italian tailor at MGM. In fact, he worked with the guy so much that he insisted that the tailor be given a credit on the film as his dialogue coach. Lithgow asked to be referred to as Lizardo, his oddball villain character, between takes. Now, normally that would be a hallmark of method actors. Uh, on RoboCop, for instance, Weller only wanted to be referred to as Murphy or Robo. Lithgow, though, isn't really method. His approach, as he sees it, is a mixture of techniques drawn from various schools of acting. He does extensive research into characters, allowing him to completely transform himself from role to role, often giving his characters distinctive voices, mannerisms, and physicality, which he develops as part of his preparation. 
In this case, it was even extended to altering his walk to mimic an old crab to bring a unique physicality to the mad scientist's role. Besides bringing in the aforementioned Christopher Lloyd into the role of John Big Boutte, the film had a plethora of performers that were all either at the start of their careers or had been developing but not hit it really big yet. It's almost a retroactive all-star cast. Most notable would be Jeff Goldblum, considered for the part because of his work on Richter's version of Invasion of the Body Snatchers. But even for him, his most famous roles like The Fly and Jurassic Park were still years away. Robert Ito, recognizable at the time as the colleague of Jack Klugman's titular character in Quincy, was so determined to be cast as Dr. Hikita that he went as far as to age himself 30 years with makeup. Clancy Brown, who would go on to play characters like the Kurgan in Highlander, the hard-ass screw in Shawshank Redemption, and numerous voice acting roles as strong, scary villains, here plays a good guy, a mildly Texan right-hand man for our hero. Likewise playing against type, Yakov Shmirnov doesn't play a wacky Russian, he's a completely straight American official. Veteran character actors Vincent Schiavelli, the tall, droopy-faced performer, probably most famous for the subway ghost in the Patrick Swayze film called Ghost, and Dan Hedaya of Cheers, The Usual Suspects, and Clueless both turn in solid performances. And in the who-could-have-possibly-seen-this-coming category, the minor role of the hospital guard would be played by some nobody who, a quarter of a century later, would take on a role that would make him world famous. The role of Mike Ehrman Trout of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul, Jonathan Banks. Other performers were Ellen Barkin, cast as the captivating Penny Pretty, who saw the film as a quirky and unconventional take on the genre, akin to Terry Southern penning Star Wars, she said. Lewis Smith was willing to shape himself physically into the role to play Perfect Tommy, enduring a grueling eight-hour dye job to achieve the perfect hair color. He picked up a suit at a second-hand shop that was so perfect for the role, he lost weight just so he could fit into it. Smith wasn't the only one looking for just the right costume. The wardrobe for the Red Electroids took a turn towards Soviet bureaucracy. Drawing from then-modern Russian fashion and lifestyle, the characters donned baggy suits in sickly greens, blues, and yellows, a nod to their anemic physical state. For the sartorial aspects of their film, costume designer Aji Guard Rogers stepped in. Having worked on movies like Return of the Jedi, American Graffiti, and The Conversation, and having previously collaborated with Richter on Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Rogers seamlessly adapted her designs to complement Riva's sets. She developed the black Electroids look based on African tribal markings while infusing Buckaroo and his Cavaliers outfits with high-end designer labels like Gianni Versace, Perry Ellis, and Giorgio Armani, all sourced from L.A. stores. A delightful quirk in costuming came in the form of Goldblum's Dr. Zweibel's cowboy outfit. Radford Polinski, the costumer, noted that the character believed his getup was perfectly suited for an audition with a name like Buckaroo. His attire was sourced in the legendary Nudie Cones Rodeo Tailors. In crafting a world as idiosyncratic as that of Buckaroo Banzai, Richter turned to his trusted comrade, production designer J. Michael Riva. They had already successfully collaborated and now embarked on a two-year odyssey, plumbing the depths of a myriad of art forms and literature, ranging from medical journals to Russian history, from African magazines to, quite unexpectedly, a lobster on Riva's nose. This lobster, in a peculiar stroke of inspiration, served as a blueprint for the design of the film's Lectroids. Riva also drew on the speculative work of Canadian-American paleontologist Dale Russell, Russell hypothesized a creature he called Dinosauroid, a theorized evolutionary branch of the dinosaurs had they managed to survive. We've seen the idea used as inspiration on the Voyager episode Distant Origins. Riva had to tweak the concept, though, as a true-to-life dinosauroid prosthetic would have rendered the actors immobile. The final makeup, on the other hand, was composed of 12 separate pieces of latex appliance per alien, each tailored to the unique facial structure of the individual actor. 
Despite being completely inhuman, you can easily tell the difference between Christopher Lloyd or Vincent Schiavelli's aliens from those around them. When it came to the design of the spacecraft, Richter and Riva eschewed the common metal spaceship trope for something more organic, a nod towards the deep sea oyster shell. They enlisted the help of Gregory Jean Inc. and Stetson Visual Concepts to bring their sketches to life, with seashells serving as a real world model. Richter's intent was to view the film with a certain ramshackle charm, a reflection of the real world, he felt, where the act of constant repair is simply the norm. Embodying the true spirit of Buckaroo Banzai, director Richter compiled a hefty 300-page tome, The Essential Buckaroo, which cataloged the incomplete scripts and copious notes amassed by the writer. Among these were various references to a villain called Hanoi Zan, the leader of the World Crime League. However, while Keaton was approached with the idea of a trilogy in mind, David Benjamin was starting to get cold feet. It seemed that the weirdness of the picture was really starting to sink in, and he seemed to have less confidence that this was going to work out. He insisted this movie was going to be a singular affair, with no potential sequels on the horizon. Consequently, every mention of Zan was excised from the script, including an original opening scene that depicted Buckaroo's father murdered by Zan and featured Jamie Lee Curtis as Buckaroo's mother. September of 1983 marked the commencement of principal photography. The industrial suburb of Southgate in Los Angeles, the Lakeview Medical Center in the San Fernando Valley, and the vast expanses of a dry lake north of the San Bernardino Mountains served as diverse backdrops. The now iconic jet car was brought to life by the collaborative efforts of Riva, art director Stephen Dane, and thrust racing owners Jerry Siegel and George Hedebeck. Melding elements from a Ford F-350 truck, a Grand National stock car, air scoops from a DC-3, and a one-man cockpit inspired by a Messerschmitt fighter plane, they birthed the vehicle as weird and quirky as its driver. Production set foot in diverse locations such as the Bonsai Institute exteriors shot in rustic can in Los Angeles. Interiors filmed in an art deco house designed by MGM art director Cedric Gibbons for his wife, Dolores Del Rio. And deserted rooms at Brentwood's VA hospital, which served as Dr. Lazardo's room at the Trenton Home for the Criminally Insane. In an ingenious nod to cinematic history, set decorators rented a collection of 1930s electrical props from the original Boris Karloff Frankenstein films for Lazardo's 1938 laboratory scenes. The deserted industrial site, Alpha Tubing, further accentuated the eerie ambiance. The abandoned Firestone Tire Factory and Wilmington's Department of Water and Power, on the other hand, played host to Yo-Yo Dine Propulsion Systems and Dr. Lazardo's Shock Tower, respectively. Through it all, the spirit of camaraderie prevailed on the set. Peter Weller recalls a particularly amusing scene in which he just couldn't stop laughing at the hilarious repartee between his co-stars Christopher Lloyd and John Lithgow, leading to repeated retakes. At one point, Lloyd's ad-lib completely broke Lithgow out of character when, in response to Lazardo's dismissal, the extremely frustrated minion finally steps forward and just flips him off, a move that so tickled everyone present they carefully edited it to get it into the movie. Despite Bedjelman's incessant interference during the initial stages of filming, there was a strange obsession with not having too many shots of Buckaroo Banzai's red frame glasses threatening to get the film shut down if there were more than four. They tested the limits with a bizarre watermelon scene at one point. Goldblum even ad-libs about the odd presence of a watermelon for no reason whatsoever. But this was actually there to test to see if the studio had become so frustrated he'd just given up paying attention to the film. The fact that no one demanded to know about the damn watermelon told Richter, nobody's really paying attention and we're free to do whatever we want. They create a very collaborative atmosphere, and not just with allowing the actors to ad lib. At one point, the president needs to declare war, and when the actor opens the envelope, he bursts out laughing. Asked why, he said the paper had been labeled Declaration of War, the short form, something the prop master had created in the spirit of the film. Nobody told him to, he just knew he had to have something in there and decided to make that. 
So amused by this, Richter shot a close-up of it for the film. After it was finished, Benjamin demanded that it needed a grander denouement than a mere kiss. Budget constraints led Richter to conceive of an innovative music video style credit sequence set to new music by Michael Bodecker. However, due to the song not being ready in time, the sequence was filmed to the tune of Billy Joel's Uptown Girl. This quote-unquote gleefully bizarre scene shot against the backdrop of the Sepulveda Dam also teased a potential sequel, Buckaroo Banzai Against the World Crime League, a cheeky nod to the excised Hanoi Zan material. However, it wouldn't be until 2021 when the world would finally get Buckaroo Banzai Against the World Crime League, albeit in novel form. The film went on to be a cult classic, even though it failed at the box office. In a peculiar twist of fate, it was Dave Bedjelman's own lack of faith in the wider world of Buckaroo Banzai that laid the foundation for a legal conundrum that would later engulf Kevin Smith's intended television series. Bedjelman's insistence on securing only the rights to the single script, The Adventures of Buckaroo Banzai Across the Eighth Dimension, without any interest in the larger universe it belonged to, turned out to be the Achilles heel in MGM's claims to the franchise TV rights. This oversight, originating from that lack of foresight or disinterest, ultimately caused the unraveling of their ambitions to bank on the cult classic. While the TV series collapsed as a result, it probably was for the best. I mean, what kind of respect could the studio really have for the material if it didn't even want to either pay off or hire the creator? Perhaps one day someone will finally be ready to do what's right, but for now, there's many other perfectly legitimate works from cartoons to comics and, of course, the cult classic itself.